There is nothing more iconic than Doom. It didn't take us long to realize that the coolest thing you could do with a computer was simulate a demon and then shoot said demon point blank with a shotgun. Even now, multiple decades later, the Doom engine is still one of the best case studies for aspiring game developers. If you want to create your own game engine, but aren't sure where to start, I want to show you some practical concepts you can steal directly from the Doom engine source code and implement yourself. All of these will be language agnostic, so it doesn't matter if you're writing C or Python, and none of them have anything to do with 3D graphics. Despite its status as one of the early 3D or 2.5D games, I actually think Doom is a perfect case study for making your first 2D game engine. Using an existing game engine to make games is a fantastic approach that works for a lot of people. I prefer to use a small rendering library like SDL, Raylib, or Love2D simply because I don't enjoy the workflow of the big, general purpose, buggy beasts that are modern engines. I've seen this elicit a strong reaction from people online before. Like, they're offended that you would be stupid enough to waste your time by not using their favorite engine. The simple fact is that by virtue of compromise, none of the current engines will be perfect for your game. They all have their own flaws and trade-offs. Building your own engine is not reinventing the wheel, because the wheel is a perfectly efficient solution. None of these engines are that. Obviously, building your own engine has its own set of challenges, so the final decision is an individual one. My personal driver for disliking game engines is that they just try to do too much. Games are an inherently complex web of interconnected systems, and general purpose engines by design have to include systems that you won't need for your game. But due to the mentioned interconnectedness of these systems, you will still inherently add complexity to the systems that you do want to use. The whole program ends up being big, slow, and unpleasant to use, in my opinion. This is a data structure that stores the player data during gameplay in Doom. You can see it has the position and momentum using X, Y, and Z coordinates, and the current health. Since the play entity shares a lot with the enemies, the same struct is also used for them. It stores additional information like the current target, which is usually the player, the current sprite and frame and a spawn point. The same struct is used to store barrels, items, projectiles and points of interest. Actually, if you look at the type enum for this struct, it can represent 137 different entity types. When creating your own game engine, it can be tempting to go crazy with hierarchies of object orientation that will represent your state in the perfect type safe way or to reach for a popular paradigm like ECS that promises efficient scalability and performance. But you have enough to worry about. Maybe it's worth keeping your entity simple. The fat struct, as it's colloquially called, is an excellent way to represent all entities in your game world. It has an enumerated type that identifies the type of entity and then stores all possible parameters that you could need as part of a single structure. It doesn't get any simpler than that. It seems a bit wasteful memory-wise, but it's really not that bad, and it saves you having to maintain a system for managing entities. One less thing to think about. Doom doesn't really have the concept of a scene, as seen in modern game engines either. There is no single data structure that stores all the state for whatever is happening right now. Instead, it uses global variables to store multiple long-lived data structures. The main one being a linked list of sectors, each of which contain the layout for a particular section of the map. The Doom Engine can do this because there isn't anything else a scene could be. All levels are lists of sectors. There is no need for unnecessary abstraction. It's okay for the engine to be tightly coupled with the game if it makes the whole system simple. And Doom makes a great example of that in places like entities and scenes, where the benefits of abstraction and generality aren't really worth the cost. That is not to say that all abstractions are inherently bad. And one abstraction you should definitely steal from Doom is the one that it uses for its platform layer. Doom stores its code in separate modules. Anything starting with a P is used for gameplay. This stores things like the entities and sectors previously talked about. Anything starting with R or V is used for rendering. This converts that data into structures that are more efficient for rendering, like the ones required for the famous binary space partitioning. And anything that starts with an I is a platform-specific interface. Files in this module provide implementations for the operating system dependencies like display, sound, and networking. None of the gameplay code has any idea what DOS, Next, or Nintendo 64 even are. There is a clear layer of separation that keeps the domain safe. And when it came time to port the game to different platforms, 
All that had to be rewritten and tested was the interface files. Even if you're using something that's already portable, like SDL, you should still wrap the platform layer in an abstraction because it makes it easier if you ever need to support a new platform or even a new medium, and it forces you to think about your game and platform code separately, which will make it easier to reason about your game logic as the project continues to grow. Platform code also includes input devices. Doom pulls for input at least once per frame, and no matter the input device, it is converted to a list of events before it reaches the gameplay layer. There is a type and a couple data points that will have different meaning depending on that type. This is reminiscent of the entity struct from earlier. From there, each event is fed through a variety of responders. Each responder can optionally swallow the event so that it is not passed on further. This helps keep the flow of events simple. For example, the menu gets first dibs on all events. You do not want key presses to affect gameplay when the menu is still open. If the menu does not swallow the event, it will be passed to the heads up display, the status window, the auto map, and then the end level screen. If none of the responders handle the event, it will be converted into a tick command and passed to the 3D renderer. The tick command contains player actions like forward move and angle turn instead of raw inputs. This is useful since these commands can be saved to disk and create replays or sent over the wire for multiplayer. This is a simple but powerful system for capturing inputs. It succeeds in a lot of ways. Firstly, it is agnostic to the actual input device, meaning the only platform-specific code required for new controllers is a function that converts their poll data into the event format. The responder's architecture keeps the flow of events simple and establishes a clear priority order when it comes to processing them. And the command structure makes it easy to save replays, recreate state, support multiplayer, and add custom keybinds by changing the function that converts the events to commands. The reason that tick commands are so powerful is because of how they work with the tick system in Doom. Tick commands have no timestamp. This is because Doom runs at a fixed 35 ticks per second. On each iteration of the main loop, the engine will calculate how many completed ticks have passed and advances the simulation by that amount. This means that the game can only run at a maximum of 35 frames per second. In my opinion, this is a small price to pay for the advantages like multiplayer networking, demos, and simpler physics logic. This may seem controversial, but I would challenge any game that states they absolutely need variable frame rate, especially if you're making your first game engine. If Minecraft is fine running at an even smaller 20 ticks per second, I think you should seriously consider the advantages of running at a fixed frame rate. Interpolation is always an option if you decide you want a smoother experience. The fixed tick rate simplifies the game logic by splitting different modules into tickers. On each tick, the game will go through all the tickers and notify them that a tick has passed. They can all act independently, but remain synced thanks to the fixed rate. Inside the gameplay ticker function, there is a separate function to run thinkers, which will process all the monsters. Run thinkers stores a list of all the things that are currently thinking. This lets thinkers act across multiple frames. The entity struct we talked about before stores the current frame and the current state for each monster, and state machines are used to indicate what the next frame or action will be once the animation is finished. Doom stores these state machines in state tables that define the current state, the frame to render, how many ticks it lasts, what function to call in this state, which will be called during the run thinkers function, and what the next state should be. Obviously, in-game events can also change the current state, State machines are a simple way to create interesting and scalable AI. The state tables in Doom are stored in an external file that is loaded at runtime. This file, named a Where's All the Data file, or WOD, is actually where almost all the game specific code is stored. You can change the behavior of enemies, sprites, map layout, and map actions without changing the code at all. So much so that Doom 1 and Doom 2 can be shipped with the same engine simply by using a different WOD file. This is extremely powerful when it comes to scalability of content and modding, but it's also good practice to keep the game itself separate from the engine. WOD files work so well because of the tools that the Doom team created to help generate them. The map editor, named Doomed, is an example of how internal tools can help speed up development in the long run. The game designers were able to create maps even with special events and triggers using a separate editor that was decoupled from the engine. The value of internal tools cannot be understated when it comes to game design. The more you can iterate and play with things, preferably without changing your engine, 
the more you can discover what works specifically for your game through experimentation rather than guesswork. Loading assets dynamically lets you iterate faster and in turn make a better game. Doom is an excellent resource for aspiring game developers. If you're unsure where to start with your own engine, there is a wealth of knowledge available in this open source release. For me, the most important takeaways are the fixed frame rate, platform specific code and entity modeling. Each of these implementations provide huge advantages while keeping the code base simple and scalable.